There is no doubt to the fact that historically a man by the name of Jesus lived nearly 2,000 years ago, give or take, and in that what we call the first century, there's, there's no doubt about it. No historian, no scholar doubts that fact. There's just too much evidence, not just New Testament, what we call the New Testament, but in other documents that date from that era about a man by the name of Jesus that was crucified under the reign of Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem. There's that, that, that's all historical fact. Just like we know Plato was real and Aristotle was real and Caesar was real, we know that there was a man by the name of Jesus who lived and died in Palestine, was crucified under uh, the Roman administrator of that area, Pontius Pilate. We know those things to be true. What's in question in a lot of people's minds was, who was that man? Who is he? What's his identity? Other questions relate to, what did he come to do? Why did, it was, was he just this uh, rebellious teacher that ended up getting on the wrong side of uh, his religious leaders and the wrong side of Rome and uh, they, they decided to get rid of him before he could cause any more of a disturbance. What did he come to do? Why? Why did he come? Why, Why has his life caused such a stir, not only in that first century, but let's think about it, you know, 21 centuries later uh, still. So what did he come to do? Uh, and the, the question, did he rise from the dead? Did he rise from the dead? Is, is he alive? Those are questions of identity, intention, and invitation that comes from, uh, if the first two are true, then what's this invitation that applies to you and me today? So uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a, couple, a look at uh, these things. We're going to take a short road trip of sorts. I'm calling it On the Road and it's uh, as Jesus is traveling towards Jerusalem, there's some stops along the way, and there's some things that happened, and there's some things that he said, and, and, and things like that. And we're going to look at a small portion of that today, next week, and then on Easter, Resurrection Sunday. So, um, why? Who is he? Why did he come? And what's the invitation that he extends to people in the uh, 21st century in which we live. So let's go think first of all. The first stop we're going to take is uh, comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. And it's a, maybe a familiar passage of Scripture to you. It's uh, We're going to read it here. Uh, but it's basically when he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? But let me read that. Mark 8, 27 through 30. Jesus went out along with his disciples uh, to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. So he's, he's traveling, he's on the road, and on the way. So they're along the way. It'd be kind of like you're driving in the car with your kids and you ask them a question. You know, uh, he's, he's walking, they're traveling. And he questioned his disciples saying to them, who do people say that I am? What's, what's the word on the street? What are, what are people coming to you and what are you overhearing in the marketplace? Who, who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, uh, and others one of the prophets. And he continued questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And I just, we're not under that restriction anymore, right? Now it's the other way around. Go out and tell everyone about me. But he had reasons for doing that, and he warned the t so he warned them not to tell anyone about him because they just weren't ready for that to break onto the scene yet. So there's opinions about Jesus, and some of those same opinions that the disciples uh, listed there are some of the same opinions about Jesus that you hear today. But he's a prophet. Islam believes that Jesus was a prophet. Uh, and some people think that he was a miracle worker. Some people think he was a deceiver, you know, that uh, there was some kind of like David Blaine magic tricks going on. I, I don't know. But some people think he was a deceiver. Uh, everybody recognizes that he was a rabbi, which means teacher. Uh, and, and some people believe that he's either a liar, a lunatic, 
or, or he is actually who he said he was, that he was Lord. So those are the, the word on the street. And you'll hear a lot of that same stuff today. And if you just look up the inter- on the internet, who is Jesus, and you'll get, you'll get all kinds of different uh, answers to that question. But then Jesus asked his disciples, okay, look, you've checked it out on the internet. You've talked to your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, uh, twice removed, and they've given you all their opinions uh, about Jesus. Then he says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you? There's all these opinions, but what do you say? And I think if Jesus were here physically today, he'd say, okay, what, who, who do you think I am? What do you say about me? If you could personalize that question coming to you this morning, what's the answer in your heart? Who do you say that Jesus is? And it's in Matthew 16. That's the same account here that, that, uh, that Matthew added these words to Peter's statement because it was Peter that says, you are the Christ. Um, and he says this, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the of the living God. Uh, The word Messiah or Christ means anointed one, the one that was sent out by God, sent by God. And so you are the one sent by God. So I got to thinking about it. There's all these opinions about Jesus. And what does the Father say? Because when when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, uh, Jesus said, way to go, Peter. You got it right. And flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But my Father in heaven revealed that to you. So there's all these opinions about Jesus and who he is, prophet, teacher, miracle worker, deceiver, and the word on the street, things you'd find on the internet if you looked it up today. But then what does, what does the Father in heaven, who does the Father say that Jesus is? And, and, and Peter uh, spoke it and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you know what? That is exactly what my Father says as well, because he's the one that helped you to know that. So I got to thinking about it. If you get your information about Jesus from the wrong source, <laughs> then your information about Jesus is going to be wrong. If you get your information about Jesus, just you know, from the word of the street, searching the internet, talking to people who uh, may or may not know, and they have all these opinions, and they may sound really scholarly. If you get your information about Jesus from the wrong source, you're going to have the wrong information about Jesus. That's something to think about. So what did, what did Jesus, we got these opinions, we got what Peter said, we got what Jesus said, the Father affirms that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. What did Jesus say about himself? Because sometimes, and I've heard people say, uh, Jesus never claimed to be God. No? Let's, let's, let's look at the evidence. Let, let's, let's take a look. So what did Jesus say about himself? So I'm going to take it to John chapter 8. And we're going to look at just a few verses in John chapter 8. Uh, John chapter 8 is uh, this passage where Jesus said, you'll, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So it's, it's all about circling around about what truth is. But in John chapter 8, verses 24 and 25, look at what this says. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus is talking to them. And this is a rather blunt statement. A lot of people are, you know, like Jesus because they're so kind and compassionate. My joke in my family is I'm like Jesus because I'm the bottom line guy. Jesus can be that compassionate and he can be bottom line. He can get straight to the point and he's getting straight to the point here. Look at this. He says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. By the way, that's not a good thing. You will die in your sins for unless you believe. Now look at this. Look at, you got to understand this statement. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You'll die without your sins being forgiven. And let me tell you this, folks. If you die without your sins being forgiven, you will spend an eternity in hell apart from God. That, that's, that's just bottom line. That's the bluntness to that. But look at what Jesus said. Unless you believe that I am, I am. Now, that, that's a weird way, that's a weird statement. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And then they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said, what have I been saying to you? 
from the beginning. And then we're going to jump down to verses 58, 59 of that same chapter. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, let's go back about 1,200 years from that day when Jesus was saying this. Let's go back. And Jesus said, Before Abraham was born, I am. Now notice he didn't say, I existed. He said, I am. We're going to talk about that, but that's a very important understanding. And, then, and they, they got what he was saying, and they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple grounds. They understood what he was saying when Jesus said, I am. That's a word uh, in, in Greek that ties back to a Hebrew word that we're going to look at in just a moment. But the word I am literally means I exist. Now, Jesus is not saying, unless you believe that I exist, here I am, I'm a man, I'm Jesus, and unless you believe that I'm real, you're going to die in your sins. I mean, everybody, they're looking at him and they would say, well, yeah, of course, you're real. We just don't believe who you say you are. We just don't believe who you're claiming to be. So if we go back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Remember this story, the passage where uh, God is speaking to Moses and he says to Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt, Moses, and I want you uh, to say to my people, I'm going to set you free. I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, set my people free. And Moses is kind of freaked out about this and he's given all kinds of excuses. He ends up saying in in Exodus chapter 3, what's your name? Who are you? Who are you? If I'm going to go and say, you know, God told me to come, and God then, the word God is a lot generic, just like our word God is today. God could be anything anybody wants them, wants him to be, wants her to be. So that's, the the term God is not specific enough. I mean, you, you can say, God bless you, and you, you can, you know, get away with that in any circle whatsoever. You know, the moment you put the name Jesus instead of God, people are going to, like, whoa. You know, they're going when, when to, you, when you put the name to that. So let's, let's look at that. In, in Exodus 3.14, and God said to Moses, when Moses said, you know, who are you? This was his answer. In English, it's, I am who I am. He said, and this is what you are, shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So does that look familiar to what we just looked at in John chapter 8? I am, I am. In Hebrew, maybe you've heard the term Jehovah. I mean, there is a, uh, a religious sect called Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and they get that term because that's one possible English Uh, understanding of the Hebrew for I am that I am, Jehovah. Another possible rendering of it, and maybe you've heard this, maybe not, is Yahweh. And and they're spelled a little bit different, uh, but it comes from the same root uh, word. And and I know this is a little technical, but you guys are smart, so you can follow along here. So here, I want you to, uh, I found this on uh, on a scholar's website. He's actually a converted Jew, a Messianic Jew, and he helps us to understand some things about the word I am, the term I am, actually the name I am. Jewish, this is what he writes, Jewish people by and large prefer to avoid using any name of God. They they, they so reverence the name that they prefer not to speak the name or spell it, or write it out. So often, they would write the word God as G blank D to leave the O out so that it is not written in its entirety. Many call God Hashem, Hashem, which means the name, the name. And a common greeting in Israel is Hashem, uh, I mean Baruch Hashem, which means blessed be the name. Kind of like we sing a song, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, but blessed be the name. They, they will uh, put the name in instead of the name of God. They don't want to speak it because they might say it irreverently. They don't want to write it because that paper might get wadded up, thrown away, burnt, and then you've done something 
to the name of God. That they so reverence, that's what I'm saying, they so reverence it. And it's, it's uh, also, there's a tradition to avoid writing down the name of God, which I mentioned. And in there, they're saying that his name is holy. So in Hebrew, he goes on and writes this. In Hebrew, we do not say, I am hungry. We just say, I hungry. It sounds like preschoolish, doesn't it? You know, like your little preschool child or grandchild would say, I hungry, I hungry. They say that intentionally, I hungry. And they wouldn't say the table, that table is big. They would say that table big, that table big. We can say I was hungry or I will be hungry, but not I am hungry. Because in the Hebrew, uh, there is no is or am and the reason is, uh, in the Hebrew language, the language of the Bible, the Old Testament, the present tense of the word to be is reserved for use by God alone. Only God can say, I am. And the meaning of that word like, means eternally existence, existent. But, but it, 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 it's more than that. It's I am today, yesterday... I was, I am. There was no was there. I am today. I, I will be, I am tomorrow. And I was, I am yesterday. And that's always true. I am, I am for eternity past. I am, I am for eternity future. But I live in the present. And I will always live in the present. God will never be a has-been or a gonna-be. God is always now. God is always in the present. But he's always in the... Yesterday he was in the present. For eternity past he was in the present. For eternity future he's in the present. So that, that's, what, that's what it means. I am the eternally existent one. That's what he said to Moses, and that's what Jesus is saying. In the Greek there is two little words, ego, like I, ego, ego, am I. It means I exist. And it's written in the present tense, which means I always exist. I always exist. I have always existed. I exist today, and I will always exist in the future. I exist. And they understood what Jesus was saying. They understood that he was making a claim. They didn't believe the claim that he was making. But that's why they picked up stones and wanted to throw him, uh, stone him because they felt like that was blasphemy. And they wanted to, to kill that blasphemer. But he hid himself. He got away, snuck away, and he lived for another day. So where do we get our information about Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that you necessarily... Uh, you can say, okay, those were claims, or that was written, you know, hundreds of years later. Uh, you know, we, we, can, we can debate that, and, and I can refute that, actually, which we're not going to go into that right now. But uh, information of who he is. And notice this. G according to Jesus, unless you believe the truth about him, about who he is, you will die in your sins. So that's... It's, it's kind of like, who are you leaning your ladder against? What are you leaning your ladder against? You're going to lean it against the, the, the truth for all eternity and base your hope of eternity, uh, eternal life, on the one that is true, or you're, basing it, you're leaning your ladder against something that ultimately is going to crash and crumble and you're going to regret it. So it's, it's important. It's important that we settle the question in our mind. And, and, and maybe if you have some issues, you could say, you? so Jesus, who are you? Just exactly who are you? People say this, that preacher said that, you know, help me to understand. Help me to know who you are. So that's his identity. And then this passage of scripture that we're on the road and, and moving along with Jesus, it, it moves on a little bit more. Same passage is picking up with verse 31. And he began to teach them saying that the son of man, that was his favorite term for himself. He was the son of God, is the son of God, but he's also the son of man. That's his God and humanity combined into one. The word made flesh. We celebrate that. Remember it especially at Christmas time. And he began to teach them that the son of man must, you can underscore that, must suffer 
many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. Those were all the religious leaders of the day. It's going to be rejected by them and be killed. He doesn't specify crucifixion there, but he says, and be killed. And after three days, rise from the dead. I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. I'm not going to commit suicide, but I'm going to be killed. And after three days, I will rise from the dead. And you've heard me say this before. Anybody who can predict the resurrection and carry it out, I'm all in. I believe anything else that he says because he did it. He carried it out. It happened. So, and after three days, rise from the dead, and he was stating the matter plainly. You know, so Mark writing this says he wasn't speaking figuratively in flowery language. He was being bottom line, straight to the point. And at least, this is chapter 8, in fact, chapter 9 of Mark, it's repeated. In chapter 10 of Mark, it's repeated. And they didn't get it. So if you feel like, you know, you don't get a sermon, you know, you, don't, you read something in Scripture and you don't get it, you're in good company because neither did Peter and neither did James and neither did John. In fact, in one of those occasions, as you read in chapter 9 or chapter 10, they, they, they start arguing about who's the greatest. I mean, Jesus just said, guys, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. It's just a couple days away. I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be killed. And, 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 and then they're over here saying... I'm more important than you, Peter. No, Peter said, no, I'm the one that's most, you know. They, they just get in, and they, they don't get it. And they didn't get it now either. And so it says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, the word rebuke means to correct. You ever feel like you needed to correct Jesus? <laughs> Have you ever been disappointed with something that God either you felt like he did or he didn't do, he didn't answer that prayer, and you got frustrated because of it? Isn't that a way of being, of trying to correct Jesus? Like, Jesus, if you knew what you were doing, you would have answered that prayer the way I asked for it to be answered. I mean, isn't, it, isn't that what that means? You know, correct him. And Peter, Jesus I can, you, can you just picture this? Jesus, come here. Come here. Don't talk like that. Don't say that stuff. We know you're the king, and we're going to go to Jerusalem, and you're going to be anointed king of Israel, and we are going to take over the Roman Empire, and Israel is going to rise to its former glory. That's the understanding that they had. That was their understanding of what the Messiah was going to do when the Messiah came. And Jesus saying these things just doesn't fit the bill. So he begins to correct, rebuke Jesus. But turning around and seeing his disciples, Jesus knew he needed to immediately deal with this. He couldn't let this take root either in his own heart or in that of his disciples. And so he rebuked Peter publicly and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on man. So by saying you're not setting your mind on God's purposes, he is saying it is God's purpose for me to go to Jerusalem, to be rejected, to suffer many things, to be killed, and to rise from the dead. And Peter, I mean, Jesus was resolute in his determination. He, he set his face. He was bound and determined to carry out that mission for his life because that was his intention. The cross and the resurrection were predetermined, and Jesus was determined to see it through. It was predetermined. Let me read a portion of a manuscript of a sermon that I, that I ran across. Men of Israel... Listen to these words, Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over to you by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held 
in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue was overjoyed. Moreover, my flesh shall also live in hope for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and that God and his tomb is with us to this day. So because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. It is this Jesus whom God raised up, a fact to which we are all witnesses. By the way, that manuscript comes from Peter. It's found in Acts chapter 2 of, um, in verses starting at verse 22. And that quote from the Old Testament is from Psalm 16 verses 10 and 11. So the cross was predetermined. Predetermined. It was not an accident. It was intentional. And the intention behind it, we'll talk more about that next week as we continue on this road. So the cross was part of the predetermined plan of God. And it really wasn't for Jesus' sake, was it? Whose sake was it for? Everyone sitting in this room, everyone who will ever listen to this, everyone who's ever walked on planet Earth. God's predetermined plan, the way to rescue mankind, goes through the cross. Goes through the cross. There is no other path. So then, Jesus goes on in the midst of this uh, and answers this question. Does it matter how committed I am to Christ? Does it matter? I mean, people would say, well, I, I believe in God. I go to church some You know, I donate to charity a little bit. We might might say of somebody else, they're a good person, they would give you the shirt off their back. Does it matter how committed I am to Christ? Well, listen to how Jesus answered that question. We pick up with Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And he summoned the crowd together. Now, keep in mind, this is right on the heels. This This is like one event. Uh, And he summoned the crowd together with his disciples. Now, the the disciples, you could say, well, they're the ones that were really committed, right? They had left their fishing nets, their tax collection booths. They had left home, and and they traveled with Jesus everywhere he went for that three-year period of time that Jesus was was doing that. And and so they were like, you could say, like, they're the really committed ones. uh, But he summoned the crowd. This wasn't just to those 12 disciples. This was everybody else. And and, um, before we read this, Jesus did not bat an eye when he said this. Jesus did not back down. He did not water down his invitation. There are not tears of followers of Christ. You need to know that. And he summoned the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, If anyone... If any of you, anyone, wants to come after me, you must, there's that word must again, you must deny, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever, anyone, if any of you, wants to save their life, you're going to lose it. That life you cling to, Now, he's not talking about physical life, clinging, you know, to physical life. He's talking about the life that you have in mind for yourself, the kind of life you want to live, the kind of life you want to, you know, get a good job, buy a nice house, have some, whatever your plans for your life are. Whoever wants to save, hold on to their life will lose it. But whoever loses his life, now he's not talking about dying, 
But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. He's telling us where to find life, folks. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does it matter if you're the richest man in the world, but you die and go to hell? What does it matter if you have all the treasures of this life? Or few of the treasures of this life? What does it matter if you have all of that, but you lose your sense of self in the process? And you forfeit your soul. For what could a person give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... (laughs) I think those words could easily describe the current generation that we live in as well. The Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I recently read a book called Hiking Through. It it details the uh, journey of a man from Holmes County, Ohio, actually, that uh, uh, hiked the Appalachian Trail from start to finish uh, in at one period of time. It's over 2,000 miles. takes five to six to seven months uh, to do that on a continual basis. 2,000 miles, five months of a continual journey. The author, Paul Stutzman, states that in order to take this kind of journey, it has to be the most important thing in the world to you. It has to be the most important thing. Every year, over 5,000 people endeavor to take such a journey. That means either starting in Maine or in Springer Mountain, Georgia. They start this trek intending to do the entire 2,000 plus miles. Only 25% of them finish that journey. 75% start with good intentions, but then something happens and they drop out. To succeed on the trail, there are some musts. Number one, it must be the most important thing in the world to you. And number two, you must not quit. Every day, every day, you get up, put on your backpack, and walk 10 to 20 miles every day. Every day. You must. There's some musts. And Jesus said there's some musts when it comes to following him. Notice, must is not options. Must is not, hey, there's, here, here's, you, you, can, you can buy in at this package, you know, at this low price. And if you want a little bit more, you've got to buy in you know, a little bit higher price. And if you want the full Monty, you, know, you buy in at this price. <laughs> Jesus said there, there's no. If anyone, if anyone, Includes us. That, listen, folks, this is Jesus' uh, statement and invitation to us today. If you want to follow Jesus, these things must, underscore must, be true of you as well. True of me as well. It's not optional. Listen to what he says. You must deny self. Now, this is not denying yourself that chocolate cake, you know, with ice cream at the birthday party. That's, that's not what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about denying self. That might be an important thing for me to do more of. But anyway, um, it's, it's, that's not the kind of denial. And it's not denying our identity. <clears throat> it's not belittling ourselves. It is denying self-rule. Denying the right that we think we have to be in control of our own life. Because it's by being in control of our own life is what got each of us and humanity into the mess that it's in. And scripture calls that three-letter word S-I-N. Self-determination. Self-rule. Living life the way I want to do it. Isaiah said it like this in chapter 53. All of us are like sheep. <clears throat> We've just gone to our own way. We do our own thing. We decide what our plan for our life is and we want to carry it out. Self-determination. Self-rule. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to give that up. 
Number two, you must take up your cross. That doesn't mean wear a cross necklace. Taking up your cross, you think about it. <laughs> you take a, 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 person, a person of that day that took up their cross, they carried it to the end of their life, which in the execution that they would have all been familiar with because they would have seen how Rome executed people through crucifixion. Just like Jesus had to carry the cross beam that ultimately he was going to be crucified on and then he couldn't bear it because of the beatings and the whipping that he had, so they got a guy to carry it for him. So once you picked up the cross and were carrying it, it was for the rest of your life. You get that? But Jesus isn't saying you're going to die soon, but what he's saying is you're going to carry that for the rest of your life. It's not a weekend deal. Oh, I'll pick it up and carry it on the weekends. Oh, I'll pick it up and carry it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'll, you know, he says, no, it's an every day for the rest of your life, no matter how long or how short it's going to be. And that cross was also, and they didn't get it at the time. They would have got it later. It's a way of identifying with him. Identifying with Jesus who took up his cross and was crucified for us. And it's our way, it's, a, it's symbolic of identifying with Jesus, carrying out his intention for us because he said it's for his sake and for the gospel's sake. The gospel means, that means the spread, the dissemination of the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live. If anyone must, they got to take up the same mission that Jesus had, still does have. You get that? It's, it's not optional. It's not optional. Jesus didn't bat an eye when he said this. You must, and must follow Jesus. I mean, that's, that's pretty, if, if, if Jesus isn't leading us, then we're not following him. If he's not in control of our life, then we're not following him. If he's not directing our life, then we're not following him. If, he's not, if, if we're not praying about the decisions that we make, the purchases that we make, the choices that we make, how we live as a parent or a spouse or an employee, or if we're not praying and, and seeking God's will, if we're not having, in essence, the, the prayer, Lord, teach me to know and to do your will in every aspect of my life. Teach me to know and to do your will. And I, folks, I'll tell you something. I've been doing it for over 40 years. It's a lifetime journey of learning. I'm not saying I've mastered it by any means. I still pray that prayer. God, teach me to know and to do your will. Because the moment I think I've got it figured out, I don't. So it's a lifetime. It's a journey. It's a journey to the end of following Jesus. In Luke's parallel, kind of a passage in Luke 14, 28, uh, Jesus followed this up with talking about counting the cost. If a man is out to build a tower and he doesn't take count of his resources and the money that he has and he only gets part way, you know, build it. And basically, Jesus says, isn't everybody going to laugh at him and think he's a fool? Because he didn't count the cost. Jesus is saying there's a cost to following him. We've got to give up our life for his. But the one that he gives us is way better than the one we thought we had for ourselves. And you've heard me say this if you've been around for any length of time. Life gets better for those who follow Jesus, and those who follow Jesus get better at life. It's true. Absolutely, 100% true. I say that not as a paid promoter, but as a satisfied customer. Amen. Following Jesus, believing in Jesus, putting our faith in him, equates to following him, 
Believing in Jesus without following Jesus is not really believing in Jesus at all. It's like Aunt Jemima pancakes without her syrup. They're not really pancakes at all. And this nilly-willy belief in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. Without following him is not really belief at all. Mark 8.35 rewords what Jesus just said. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So I got to thinking real quick. But I don't have time to tell you what I was just going to say. That kills me too, by the way. <laughs> Well, maybe that's a good thing. (laughs) The epitome, the epitome, I'm going to say it real quick. The epitome of losing um, life while trying to gain the whole world is Lucifer. You can read in Isaiah 14, uh, how you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will, notice the I wills, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit on the mount of the assembly um, in the recesses of the north, I will ascend to the heights of the clouds, I will make my name, myself like the most high, I will. I will. And the one who lost themselves by exalting themselves and their plan and their will is epitomized in the evil one himself. But the one who lost their life in order to find it is epitomized by our Savior. Every day of his life, It was not my will, but your will be done. It's even better than that. He made sure that his will was so entwined and merged with the will of the Father that they were one. That there was only one time that it was questionable. And that was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, I don't want to do this. If there's another way for this to happen, to save them, folks, to save us, let's do it that way. But he knew there was no other way. Not my will, but thine be done. Our Savior. He gives it all for us. We can do no less. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father. You know when you're ashamed of something in your life, you keep it hidden and you keep it secret. If we keep Jesus hidden and secret... Because we're ashamed to speak up. We're ashamed to name his name. We're ashamed to share with somebody. Because we might be embarrassed. They might laugh at us. Whoa. Jesus said, hmm. Matthew 10. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before people, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before people, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus does not enter into negotiation with us on the terms of following him. It's take it or leave it. It's take it or leave it. We don't get to negotiate what we think would be a better deal because it wouldn't be. Many of those who started that trek on the Appalachian Trail and were in the 75% that quit before the end, many of them at a later point in life go back to the point where they got off to finish the journey. You know, God lets us do that too. You may feel like, I got off the journey. I've gotten sidetracked. I didn't keep putting one foot in front of the other. For whatever reason, I got off the journey. You know, you can come back too. You can come back today. 
If you've never started the journey, today could be the day when you pray and invite Christ into your life. You invite Christ into your life and you say, Jesus, I will live for you for the rest of my life. Let's pray.